Okay, so following from the principles of some of the top traders that I've already introduced you to, so how do top traders do it then? What are the key lessons that they have to teach us about risk and money management? Before we return once again to some of the maths, let's talk about some of the psychology elements. Well, uh, John Najarian, great U.S. options trader out there. We always try to position ourselves so that we can trade tomorrow. Again, he's focusing on the losses. He's focusing on the risks. He's not focusing on the profits. He's not saying, as a leading trader could say if they so wished, that, oh, we just go for the greatest, biggest risks that we can take put all our money out there. That's how we made it. That's not what they say. What they say instead is that we always try to position ourselves so that we can trade tomorrow. They're always looking to limit downside risk. It's as simple as that. Another way it's been put is this is not a one-shot game. Trading is not about trying to make as much money as possible in the shortest period of time. As one trader put it, some firms hire professional chess players, professional backgammon players. Our guys tend to be card counters. We want to know what the odds are. They go to casinos, wait all day for the highest percentage plays, and go home. In other words, they don't just take trades as they come along. They will wait for the very best trades. Another guy to like this, he said it's a bit like being a cheater in the Serengeti. What you're doing is... You just wait and wait. Although you're the fastest animal out there, and you can kill any animal that there is, you wait for the slowest, lamest boar or whatever it is, cheetahs hunt, gazelles or whatever, you wait until you find that one where you are assured of a kill, and you go for that. You don't just pick the first one that comes along. You just wait in the shade, bide your time, let your target get tired, whatever it is. And it's the same with trading. That's what risk management is about. It is about patience and waiting and waiting. Well, I want to continue this theme, some of the psychological elements. You can get into the mind of a leading trader. And let me continue it in this way by just giving you some of the risk and money management quotes. The public perception is quite different from what the reality is. The public perception is these guys make wild bets and take huge gambles. Actually, one of them, and it was John Najarian, the options trader, he used to be a linebacker for the Chicago Bears American football team, so they come from all sorts of professions. He put it in this way, risk not thine whole wad. I can't put it in better language. In other words, it is not about crazy, crazy bets. Trading Nirvana, according to Bernard Oppity, who I mentioned earlier, is you're looking for low-risk, high-return trades. Now, people think, oh, if you want high return, you've got to take high risk. Well, that's true. But now and again, you get low-risk, high-return trades. It's those you go for. You do not need to risk a lot to profit a lot. There are a lot of trades which are not particularly risky where you can make a lot. That's the point. Let me give you an example, and this is a classic one that I always love giving people. Which would you buy in the next chart, Reckitt or Kingfisher? That's Reckitt, and you can see what would happen if you did buy that. Okay, had some rallies, but at the end of the day, nothing much. Or Kingfisher. Now, you might say, well, what's this got to do with it? You haven't told me about the uh, management of the two companies, the news flow, any other piece of information about these two companies. How can I possibly make a decision based on the limited piece of information that you've actually given me? Well, the way and the reason you can make that decision is relatively straightforward. One of the things we're looking at is the price trend. All other things being equal, let's say everything else was equal between these two companies, what would you go for? I would put it to you that you would go for, or should go for, a Kingfisher. If all other things were equal, because this is on a downtrend, this is on an uptrend. Now, it might be that you look at valuations, etc., etc., and you don't do that. Oh, by the way, that looks like Bilton, doesn't it? You look at valuations, and you might not do that. However, I'm assuming all other things are equal. What I say is you put the odds in your favor, and, but one of the things that puts your odds in your favor is the broader trend. Where is the money going? Where is everybody else willing to put their money into these things? That is, seems like a trivial thing, but I'm afraid I think it's incredibly important. You are placing the odds in your favor, going for lower risk, higher return trades. Do check the price trends. 
And this whole idea about efficient market hypothesis, the idea that markets are truly random, well, okay, if they were truly random, how do you explain this? What, that's just randomness? That doesn't look random to me. It looks like a price trend. So that's that. What about returning to some of the maths now? Ah, you know, we took a break. If you need to, press pause, go for a whiskey. Uh, if you don't, let's plough on ahead because we've got a heck of a lot of material to cover. Risk and money management. Why and when should you take risk? Let's look at this particular stock. It's going upwards. How do you work out what and when you should do? Well, all other things being equal, that looks like a good trade. Fine. This is what Bill Lipschitz, who I mentioned already, former global head of foreign exchange at Salomon Brothers, put it. Out of 250 trades in a year, it comes down to five. Three of those will be wrong, and you will lose a fortune. And two will be right, and you will make a fortune. For the other 245 trades, you should be sitting on your hands. And that's the case. With most trades, you'll make a bit, lose a bit, make a bit, lose a bit. It's only a few that give you a lot of money when you're following trends. The point is patience. That is, again, all about risk management. You're waiting and waiting until everything feels right. Right. Let's get into some of the specific rules. I'm going to give you three rules for risk and money management. Rule number one. What's the correct portion of total equity to put into a trade? By equity, I mean all the money you have to trade with. So if you've got £100,000 to trade with, how much should you put in to any one trade? This is a major problem that many investors have. But it is so important to have the right answer. And the reason it's so important to have the right answer is because it can actually have more to do with how much profits you make whether or not you pick the right stock. But you're never going to hear about this on any TV program or investment magazine because, oh, it's too boring. It doesn't sell magazine. You know, the unfortunate thing is investment magazines more and more have become like the FHM of investing. You know, it's all superficial. You know, which stocks you should own now. It's not about the actual true skills of trading. So let me tell you some of them, some of what those rules are. Well, let's say you had £100,000. Obviously, you're not going to put £100,000 on one trade. You can't put too much on, you'd, you'd be risking too much. Equally, you're not going to put £100 on a single trade. What a waste of time, effort and money that would be. How do you draw the balance? Well, former head, the former chairman of the Chicago Board of Trade, which is the world's largest derivatives exchange, put it this way. He said, una fagiola, that means one bean. You put one bean in to the bag at a time. You just collect beans and you put one bean in. In other words, you make small profits all the way home uh, rather than go for a crazy home run. And the point of that is that we actually, when we draw the balance, we're going to put not 100,000 in, sure, not 100, somewhere in between. Mathematically, we're going to work it out what that specific figure is. A level which keeps us in our comfort zone so we're not, feeling nauseous with too much money, so our trading psychology doesn't get messed up, so we don't start worrying too much. Well, how do we get to that figure? Well, in order to get to that figure, let me take you through some calculation. And here's a very important one. Let's see what happens if you trade too big. Let's say you've got £20,000 with which to trade. That's all the money you have in the world with which to trade. Fair enough? And let's say there's two traders. One trader puts £10,000 in per trade. Another trader puts in £2,000 per trade. Fair enough? Yep, absolutely. So this is the £10,000 per trade trader. And these are his results. This is the 2000 They place five trades. The first trade, both of them get a 20% gain. The next trade, they both lose 25%. The next one, they both lose 25%. The next one, they make 5%. The next one, they lose 30%. So for the £10,000 per trade trader, his equity, because remember he had £20,000 to begin with, goes up after the first trade where he makes a 20% gain on £10,000 per trade that he plays. He plays one trade at £10,000, made 20%. Well, 20% of £10,000 is £2,000. So he made £2,000 profit, adds that to his total equity, and that gives him his cumulative equity. Do you see? 
20% of 10,000 is 2,000 profit on that trade, adds it to his total equity, which is 20,000, and brings it back down to his cumulative equity, which is 22,000. And then he does it again. But this time he loses 25% of 10,000 pounds, which is 2,500. So if he had 22,000 pounds in the bank and he loses 2,500, he's down to 19,500. Does it again. Loses 25% of 10,000, that's 2,500. Gets knocked off his 19,500, he goes down to 17,000. Yeah? And so forth, 5% then. At the end of five trades, he's down 27.5%. Why? He's only got £14,500 in the bank. He started off with 20000 That means he is down 27.5%. This trader, on the other hand, did exactly the same trade. So he had the same percentage changes, except he was trading with £2,000. So on the first trade, made 20% profit on £2,000. That's £400. Takes him to £20,400. Fair enough? Yeah. And so forth. At the end, he's only got £18,900 out of his total 20000 to start off with. So this trade is down 5.5%. Why the big difference in performance? Why the big difference in performance? After all, both traders had the same trades. Up 20, down 25, down 25, up 5, down 30. They both had the same amount of money to start with. It wasn't to do with their stock-picking abilities. They both had the same stocks. It wasn't to do with how much money they've both got. It wasn't to do with the level of skill they have, because it wasn't to do with stock picking. It wasn't to do with which stock broker they use, because I've ignored those trading costs for now. What was it to do with? I'll give you the answer. There's only one thing which is different between the two of them. It's how much money they put on each trade. Yet, look at the difference in performance. There's a huge difference in performance. Well, when those magazines which want you to buy XYZ stock because it's 10 stocks which must go up tomorrow, 10 hugely undervalued stocks and all that other rubbish that they write on the front covers, when they're writing all of that, they are writing it to give you, allegedly, a good performance in your stocks. But look at this. I didn't talk about any specific stocks, and yet the difference in performance between these two traders is humongous. This trader has significantly outperformed this one. And I purposely took losing trades. Look at this guy. After just five trades, and there's nothing unusual about these, you could easily make 20% on one, lose 25 on two, make five on the other, and lose 30. In five trades, this guy's lost a quarter of his money. He ain't going to have sleepy, restful nights. He's probably going to cancel his summer holiday. Sooner or later, he's got to break the bad news to his spouse. Not happy. This guy, okay, he's had the same trades. They're not particularly good, but he's not down much. He's going to have nice, sleepy nights. No problem. He can go to sleep. Well, it's all to do with how much you trade. My point with this is we haven't come up with the mathematical formula yet, we will do in a second, of how much money you should put in a trade. What I'm showing you here is money management and the importance it has to risk management and to performance. The amount of money you put on a trade directly affects performance, risk, therefore. That is money management. We're going to go into details about exactly how much money you should put in a trade in the next chapter.